we go. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this is the uh, second session of VMS Medicine Live. Um, we'll be discussing radiological emergencies today. Uh, this is our second online conference. Um, so we're still getting a little bit used to this and how it works with a group. Um, but last time went very well, and we'll see you again. Uh, just to rehash from last time, um, our vision of this is that this is an opportunity for EMS physicians, both in academia and from the community, um, can get together to share information, uh, share good cases they have, and maybe a little bit of board preparation as well, though that is not our uh, underlying focus. Um, also hope to have a group involvement. Um, we do want to have you see your peers across the country, uh, not just at the annual meeting at NASP, but uh, give you a second chance to uh, see folks. Um, in the future, we do hope to involve whatever special skills your facility has or you have to uh, bring to the group. Um, there are three directors, myself, Dr. Cooney and Dr. Clemency from uh, SUNY Buffalo. Uh, just a couple of ground rules. Uh, we'll be muting everyone except for Derek, uh, just to keep it simple during the presentation. Uh, you can chat. Actually, I'm going to change it to, to chat Derek if you have a, a question during the uh, presentation because he's going to control the, the session once I hand it to him. Or you can raise your hand uh, under the uh, managed participants. You, there's actually a place to raise your hand virtually. You can try that. Uh, we will be recording the presentation and uh, working on getting a site up to post our presentations. Um, but you're free to record on your side as well and, and share, do with it what you will. We'll have questions at the end. Um, if you have a question, just unmute yourself. I ask the question. You always message me or message Derek if you want to rather do it that way, and we're, we're happy to answer. Um, if you have use Zoom before and have a suggestion how to improve it, let us know. Uh, serious problem, Let just email me. Um, I'm not sure I can fix it, but uh, email me and we'll try to get a fix for next time. So today we're having uh, Derek Cooney, uh, who wears many, many hats. Uh, he's the, here at Syracuse, he's the EMS Fellowship Director. He runs Rural Metro uh, in Syracuse, Mercy Flight Central and Air Medical Service and has uh, multiple national, regional, and local responsibilities as well. And with that, I'm going to hand off the, uh, I hope, hand off the hosting duties to Derek. And I'll go away. All right. Second. 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 Good. Well, um, I'm happy to uh, be able to share this uh, special topic. Uh, with you guys, uh, radiologic emergencies is actually something um, I find pretty exciting, and uh, I hope you do too. Hopefully, you'll never have to use this information, but uh, you should use some of it anyway uh, to ready your, yourself and your community uh, for a potential response. And hopefully, by the end of this, um, you will realize that even if you don't have a nuclear reactor plant uh, in your community, this still is important information uh, um, and something you should probably think about when you're doing disaster planning uh, and uh, planning for uh, your annual schedule for drills. Um, how to see, looks like I don't have, been, wait, there we go. There now. So I'm, yeah, I'm the director of EMS and disaster medicine at SUNY Upstate, but I'm also sort of a, uh, a nuclear power weenie. Uh, and I'm the medical director for Nine Mile Point Nuclear Power Station, which actually has two reactors, but only one really cool cooling tower, as you can see. Um, this is a U.S. commercial nuclear power reactor map. Uh, this is from 2010, although I have to admit there's, there are a couple uh, being built, but there's not a lot difference between this map and today. And um, this is a zoom in of some part of the Northeast that includes our shop. Uh, if you see here, you guys see the mouse moving? I think you can. Um, this is Syracuse, New York. This is actually Oswego, New York. Um, that's, uh, there's three plants. So every reactor is considered a plant. There's three plants here and one plant here. This is Ganae in Rochester, and this is Nine Mile Point in Fitzpatrick, uh, north of uh, Syracuse, New York, and Oswego. This gives you an idea. This comes from this website. You can actually look up your own community on this 
this website listed and out based on a singular prevailing winds as they were. Um, here's a little another blow up. This shows you the New York City area. Um, I gave a uh, grand rounds one year down there and wanted to kind of show them, yeah, there's no nuclear plant in New York City, but look how all these circles overlap the area. Red is the threshold for radiation sickness. 75 reds is delivered uh, in the, during the incident. And then orange is the maximum radiation dose recommended for emergency responders. So you can see there's a fairly significant orange area. And then uh, evacuation re recommended uh, area. And then on down all the way to the big circle, which is a 50 mile potential contamination zone, um, which would have less health uh, concer concerns, but however, significant geopolitical concerns, or excuse me, significant uh, political and economic concerns. This is a blow up of our own uh, local area. Here's Syracuse, New York, down here where I'm speaking from. And here's the, uh, the uh, reactors at uh, Oswego, New York. So on this day and time, the prevailing winds would have blown most of the fallout uh, over into Lake Ontario, which would in fact not, affect not only the United States, but also uh, parts of Canada, obviously. Uh, if the prevailing wind was different, obviously all of these at this area up to Watertown and would be affected or potentially all the way down into Syracuse, if you could just imagine that plume in the opposite direction. Now, you know, whether the prevailing wind would ever uh, hit Syracuse is a question uh, that we ask, but certainly the population in this area is significant and would be affected. So, some of the things we want to do today, we're going to review some basic uh, radiological facts, discuss some sources and causes of radiological exposure and contamination, discuss the pre-hospital approach to the event, and then discuss basic patient uh, management concepts. And uh, in, in and all that, I think it would be pretty obvious to define the role of the EMS physician as well. So quickly, I'm going to go through some basic radiologic facts. Most of you will be familiar with this concept, but I just want to make sure we're all speaking the same language. So non-ionizing radiation is not typically considered a direct major threat to humans. Uh, because it doesn't uh, cause damage to DNA. But radiation, when we say radiation, what do we mean? We really mean ionizing radiation. So that's a radiation with a high enough frequency and short enough wavelength uh, that it causes damage uh, where it matters. So here's the spectrum again. And uh, here you can see all the way through visible light, except for the most highest level of ultraviolet radiation is all considered non-ionizing radiation. Power lines, radio, all that stuff. But we get the highest end of the very, very end of the ultraviolet radio, uh, spectrum and then into X-ray and, and uh, gamma ray, that's all significant ionizing radiation. This is a table that sort of describes the different types of ionization that we're kind of concerned about. Alpha particles, beta particles, gamma uh, rays, uh, and neutrons. Also X-ray, uh, most of what you can say about X-ray falls into the gamma ray. And I'll just mention something else about x-ray in a moment, but if you can see, just to get everybody back uh, in their head uh, so this all makes sense, alpha particles, right? Uh, this is what uranium and plutonium uh, would give off some alpha particles. The energy, energy varies, the speed varies, um, and then, but their range in air is relatively short, right? Five centimeters is all the distance this will travel in air, and it really it can't even uh, penetrate the dead skin of your epidermis. Um, you don't require any shielding when you handle uh, alpha particles. Um, and really, they don't show a lot of threat to humans unless it's ingested or it becomes shrapnel and it becomes embedded. Uh, so if it's inhaled, swallowed, injected, or uh, becomes uh, uh, embedded in the human, then it becomes a significant health risk uh, because it's actually relatively high energy, even though it doesn't penetrate well. But if it comes inside the human body, it becomes a significant problem. Beta particles, they're high-speed electrons, basically. Their speed vary, their energy uh, varies some, and they can travel a bit farther through air, about five meters. Um, they can get just really through the top layers of skin, and actually, if you hold something up between you, like if you took a magazine and held it between yourself and the emission and the emitter, it probably wouldn't be a big deal. It be it would be stopped. Um, so superficial skin burns, if there's enough beta particles, uh, are, can occur, but it really doesn't cause the deep end organ tissue damage that we think of when we think of radiation injury. Gamma ray is really where the money's at when we're talking about this usually. Uh, the energy varies, uh, but it really penetrates up to 500 meters through uh, air and um, 
and it can uh, penetrate right through um, almost anything. So you require shielding. So this is when we talk about uh, uh, using um, uh, lead shielding and whole body injury and then uh, measure ca many casualties are possible if there was a significant release. Uh, X-ray, really, I, d I don't want to get too much into it, but X-ray is it different in that, um, you know, these emitters, this is a radiological decay, so they're always producing uh, gamma ray, okay? But when you're talking about X-ray, that requires energy in to get energy out. So that's bombarding a metal surface, usually a metal surface with electrons, makes the electrons bounce from one uh, orbit to another, and that releases where we get it. So when an X-ray emitter, almost every X-ray emitter, there's some isotopes release X-rays, but for the most part, when we talk about an X-ray emitter, that's some sort of man-made ray. And then the neutron is the scariest of all. So it's an uncharged particle. It's a product of fission, so they are at the reactor core uh, within the... Uh, the initial containment, there are new, there's a significant neutron load. Um, it has less uh, range than gamma, but it penetrates significantly, and the energy is pretty significant. Um, and uh, again, it's all energy dependent, so it depends on how you're getting your neutrons. Um, it's a whole body injury, and it can cause many casualties. They are, there is a, a international ban on neutron bombs uh, because they penetrate uh, significantly, and to such a point that you could actually uh, have a, a ground dispersal, uh, excuse me, a ground uh, detonating, uh, air detonating bomb that would kill everybody but not knock down the buildings. So that's why there's an international ban on neutrons. So in other words, we don't want any, get anywhere near any neutron uh, uh, radiation. And so we need to think about that when we think about reactors, nuclear reactor plants. So here's just a quick uh, diagram it shows a hand here, but basically here's your radiation source. So alpha particles is stopped by a sheet of paper. Beta particle will stop by really clothing. Gamma rays, it can be stopped by several inches of concrete uh, or, or lead. And then neutrons, you really need a few feet of concrete to stop. So that's why the, the plant is surrounded by uh, uh, internal containment of such a large dry area of uh, concrete. So just quickly, radiation dose units, so we're all speaking in the same language once again. A rad is 0 0.01 joules per kilogram. A rem is the bio damage or potential uh, biological effect of a rad. So a rem is the equivalent in man, so 0 0.1 joules per kilogram. So when we talk in the hospital about grays and sieverts, that's because gray is the delivered dose and a sievert is the effective dose. So when we say someone received 6,000 centigrades throughout their, uh, their uh, radiation therapy, that's because that's what the emitter put out into the patient over time. But the actual effect based on which organ uh, was in, was in, uh, in the uh, field, that's, that's talked about in sieverts. So actually the radiologists like to talk sieverts because they're talking about uh, threat to uh, C CT scanning. This is on here not for you to memorize units, but just to remember that you could easily look this up uh, to get the conversions um, if you were looking at dose uh, response. So exposure versus contamination. This is the most important thing when we're talking about emergency planning and response is the difference between exposure and contamination, making sure that everyone we work with understands the difference. Exposure is the external radiation of the body with uh, rays of particles, and there's no radioactive material really transferred. This is just, they receive the dose uh, of the admission, and they are, their, their body tissues are affected by it. So we would measure that, remember, in sieverts or REM. And then the contamination is totally different. That's actual radiologic, or radioactive material, rather, radionucleotides, are on the person. So exposure is they've been radiated, Contamination is that radioactive material is on the person, and so there's a big, big difference. So you can have people that are going to die from their exposure brought to the hospital. If they're not contaminated, they're the only one at risk. No one else is at risk. Conversely, if they're exposed and heavily contaminated, then that risk travels with them to the degree that they are contaminated. So decontamination is going to be a key thing for us to discuss. Uh, as far as just exposure, not contamination, but exposure, remember time, distance, and shielding, those are all make sense, especially since we just talked about how far those particles 
uh, can travel through air and then through shield. So the time, the radiologic effect of that rad, the REM is, is it's really REMs per time. So the longer you're there, the worse it is. The farther away, the less likely you are to get hit by higher energy and higher concentration of, of radiation. And then shielding, obviously, is, is designed to block it. So what are the dose limits? So whole body dose limits, just to give you an idea, it would be 20 millisieverts uh, per year. Um, and then effective dose averaged over five years would be about 50. So uh, when you do NRC physicals or look at uh, nuclear power workers, you have to know those uh, occupational limits. The public really is only expected to be exposed to one millisiever per year. So if you look at the equivalent doses, remember keeping in mind that different tissues are, have a different biological effect to the same dose, the lens of the eye, 150 millisievers, the skin, 500 millisievers, uh, and uh, the hands and feet, 500 millisievers. So obviously the lens of the eye is much more sensitive. All right, EPA emergency exposures. Again, I apologize, but this is how they're reported in manuals, so that's why I keep switching doses. So the whole body limit is five REM. Uh, if you were protecting major property, then you could expect your emergency responders to expose themselves to 10 REM. Life-saving or protection of large populations would be up to 25 REM. And then if you're gonna go over that 25 REM limit, those should need to be volunteer only. And you know, it sounds opposite, of what we normally say, but in emergency response with a significant greater than 25 REM dose, we're looking for older volunteers, not younger volunteers, as opposed to the you know, usual concept that uh, emergency response is a young man's game. In this case, we're looking for people who have a shorter life expectancy uh, because um, uh, everyone's going to have the per year life uh, risk of cancer. So the shorter life you have, the less likely you are to get cancer from your exposure practical consideration. Here's some other kind of perspectives. This is millirem. Notice we switched to millirem instead of rems. You fly high enough in the atmosphere, you get less protection from the atmosphere. Um, so a flight from Los Angeles to London, you may get five millirem just from that flight. Annual public dose, on a gram. And I'm going to switch down here. Remember we talked about life-saving action guidance, greater than 25 rem, so greater than 25,000 millirem. Um, you can get mild acute radiation syndrome at about 200,000 millirem. So, uh, and then the LD5060 for humans, for the basically the bone marrow dose, is 350,000 millirem. So, keeping those things in perspective, our regulatory guidelines keep you pretty safe if you can keep your operation uh, below those exposures. Just a reminder about biological effects. Obviously, ionizing radiation can cause heat, so it can cause burns, et cetera, but also, uh, the big issue is how much damage can it do to molecular structures. Um, so as it comes in and ionizes, it causes free radical formation. And most of that is gets repaired by your own chemical repair in your body. If it damages DNA, there's three different things that can happen. Either uh, your DNA gets repaired by your usual uh, uh, molecular repair uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, the sile dies, so it goes apoptosis and you know, that's what we see with early, effect, early effects of radiation sickness, late effects and developmental effects if there's a pregnant lady involved because the cell death and specific cell lines will cause fetal abnormalities. But if the DNA mutates, then it can either affect you somatically, so you get a mutagenic transformation, i.e. cancer, or it can affect the germline, which can cause a lot of hereditable, hereditable effects. So they become, look, they look like genetic defects, but really they're, not inherited uh, from alleles, they're actually mutated in the germline at the time. So obviously women are at a higher uh, risk for that germline to be affected. Acute radiation syndrome, the spectrum of disease can get anywhere from, anywhere from sort of a sublingual, or excuse me, subclinical um, uh, flu-like symptoms uh, to bone marrow suppression, all the way to gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, and CNS. And that goes with increasing dose and think of it as a time-related issue. So if the patient presents with a flu-like syndrome uh, two days after the exposure, that's a lot better than them showing up with pulmonary edema and myocardiopathy uh, within the first 24 hours. If someone arrives after an exposure and they already have CNS effects and it's not from a bomb blast, concussion, or other trauma, it's just a radiologic exposure, 
that is the poorest possible uh, prognosis and almost no one uh, lived for very long. So uh, there is expected phases of acute radiation syndrome all the way from the exposure to a prodromal stage, latent, and they manifest disease and then hopefully they recover. Um, so the sooner you get to that, uh, the uh, manifest illness, the greater the expected dose that the patient received. So it should be, you know, significant day. The longer it takes for these to get to these stages, uh, for the first three stages, the better. Um, just a couple of dose related uh, issues. So again, this is gray. So we've switched back to RADS. Okay, so greater than 70 RADS. Uh, that's when you get bone marrow suppression expected. Um, mild symptoms may occur as low as uh, 30 RADS, but remember the biological effects versus the dose delivered. So this is dose delivered we can measure. So that's why this is all reported in RADS. Uh, gastrointestinal uh, GI symptoms, typically at a much higher dose, you're looking at uh, uh, greater than 1,000 RADS, and then cardiovascular, and then central nervous system, we're talking about about 5,000 RADS. So again, that same spectrum. Um, so some of the radiologically associated injuries, acute radiation syndrome, localized radiation injuries like cutaneous uh, radiation uh, syndrome. So we see burns and uh, or you may have an isolated exposure from, a, from an element, an industrial or uh, construction element that uh, leaves the patient with, you know, the hand or arm that was exposed uh, becomes, uh, uh, loses its microvasculature and then dies. Um, internal or external contamination uh, can lead to a different exposure pattern. Internal contamination is a big problem because uh, you really need to uh, get it out of the body um, uh, or they have a continued exposure. Combined radiation injuries are obviously what we're thinking about when we think about dirty bombs or, or weapons of mass destruction because we expect trauma uh, and burns uh, to also be combined. And then fetal effects are always a concern. Here's some sources of radioactive material. And obviously I started the presentation by showing you a cooling tower. Why? Because not just because The Simpsons was a cool cartoon, but because that's the American um, icon of uh, radioactivity. They all, we always think of the uh, nuclear power. Unfortunately, um, that leaves us really wide open to, um, to uh, radiological terrorism. And, uh, and that's kind of a sad thing, really. You're probably the most safe when you're walking around the uh, nuclear plant site. Uh, there are heavily armed guys with fully automatic rifles. Uh, the first thing they teach you when you get access, gain access to the control area is never run. Why? Because someone will shoot you and ask questions later. Now, these are heavily guarded, uh, heavily well-maintained, heavily regulated uh, sources of radioactive material, unlikely uh, to be a problem unless there is an actual meltdown. Um, Fukushima, by the way, is a similar design uh, to uh, Plant 2 at Nine Mile. The difference is ours has additional containment that all the engineers said we would never need, um, but I'm sure the Japanese wish they had had. So American reactors, all of the ones built after Three Mile Island disaster, and even those built before, many of them retrofit, are much safer than you could possibly imagine. However, there are a lot of other radiologic material in the community, and it's almost up for grabs in comparison. So cesium-137 is a 30-year physical half-life. These are in Curies now. Again, a different, uh, a different uh, activity. I apologize, but look at this. 1.5 times 10 to the 6th Curies is what we irradiate food with. So when you go to a food packing plant, they have a room that it goes through in a conveyor belt, and in the middle of the room, there's a big cesium uh, 137, and it'll, it retracts into the floor, or they have a big shield that comes down over it to shield uh, workers so they can maintain the room. Um, there was an unfortunate gentleman who uh, thought he, he, he overrode the lockout on the door. He was supposed to go and do maintenance. The shield was up. He was in there for, uh, they think, about 45 seconds before he realized what had ha that he was in unprotected. He ran back out of the room and he died within two days. So uh, that's just a food irradiator, irradiator. There's no armed guards at the food packing plant. Uh, cobalt 60, 15,000 curie used in cancer therapy. 
Um, plutonium, obviously, that's a little hard to get your hands on. That's in nuclear weapons. But some of the other things like iridium-192, that's industrial radiography. So when you have uh, underwater welding and our divers are down there and they would need to make sure that that weld is good, they have a source that they can put up behind it, put a plate in front of it, and so put the pipe in between of it, in between, and they have a type of film that will then expose so that you can use it uh, to look at weld, uh, uh, welds that you wouldn't ever be able to image otherwise. Uh, and then iodine-131, obviously nuclear medicine therapy. We, we worry about nuclear iodine for fallout considerations. Uh, uh, Mericium-241, that's what's in your um, doesn't work 50% of the time. Uh, smoke detector, by the way, that's a little plug. Don't use that. They're not safe. Um, they, uh, that stuff will be around for 432 years. Uh, and unless you eat it uh, or somehow otherwise ingest it, it's pretty safe stuff. But uh, there is actually consideration for uh, if you amassed enough of this and then somehow injected it into someone or meant yourself harm, you could eat it and cause yourself problems. But these elements are out there, and none of, and except with the exception of plutonium, um, these things are there are uh, accessible. So nuclear react. So there's accidents and terrorist events. That's what we focus most of our preparation uh, um, activities on. Nuclear reactor explosion, breach, or meltdown, which are all different things. A medical radiation therapy uh, element uh, can accidentally expose people. Um, industrial irradiator exposure, lost or stolen medical or industrial radioactive sources, and transportation issues over rail, highway, or shipping. It's been a long time since they moved, spent fuel rods. Um, shows up in the movies, but they really don't do that much anymore. It's all dry storage at the site of the reactor, so that's less of a concern. But there are other elements being moved. So in a terrorist event, they could have a low-yield nuclear weapon, although usually the technology required to do that and the sources are pretty hard to come by. Radiological dispersion device or dirty bomb is much more likely. Imagine if you got yourself a bunch of cesium and exploded it in Times Square. That would not be a nuclear reaction. There would not be critical mass. But you would have you would have a high doses of radiation spread all over the place and shrapnel. You would have your radiologic source embedded into people, which obviously would be causing a serious problem. Um, and also, Times Square would be radioactive for quite a while because it'd be hard to clean it all up. Attack on or sabotage of a nuclear facility obviously is something that they think about a lot and uh, they prepare for. So, what would we be thinking about? We would be thinking about these types of incidents that could occur in my, our event in our environment and then what would the event be like so if you had a radiation accident um, like a regular radiation accident at a nuclear site which occasionally do happen typically the number of deaths is none or one or two people total and they usually die due direct exposure radiation a radioactive dispersal device on the other hand probably would kill a few to a moderate people and it depends on the size of the explosion because typically the explosion would kill the people along with shrapnel and then the proximity of persons is the most, most important thing because the blast trauma is the issue. For the low yield nuclear weapon, however, you would have a large number of deaths uh, and, uh, any, and you could have tens of thousands of, in, in an urban area even from a 0.1 kiloton weapon. Um, and that would be from blast trauma, thermal burns, radiation fallout, uh, radiation exposure and fallout. And it depends on the distance that you were at. Now, we'll show, talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So on-scene basic priorities. Obviously, it's just like seaburn, regardless of what the issue is. So radiologic source uh, issues are, this, are similar to all of the other um, potential hazards that we talk about. So the safety of responders, safety of the victims, course of action development, uh, contamination control, medical care, and the consequences of the management. So again, see this? This chart should look very familiar. It's all hazards approach. Radioactive materials is one of the things we've got to worry about. So just because it's a radioactive event doesn't mean we can ignore all of these other things. They're all in there together. So physical hazards of the scene are most likely to force the immediate evacuation. Uh, and then some scenes, uh, the chemical nature of the contaminant may be more a threat than the actual radioactivity because a lot of these things that are radioactive sources, they're actually used in industrial processes. And so the chemical... Um, uh, state or the chemicals around them may be more dangerous than the actual contamination. Then immediate life-threatening problems will be the medical and trauma in nature in almost every possible circumstance in which we will be responding. 
So victim, victim risk analysis. The has, you got to think of the physical hazards of the assessment of the scene. We check our life threats, dangers to the victim. We consider the radiation level. So we need some sort of surveillance equipment and then calculate the accumulated dose to the rescuers so that we can make sure that we meet those uh, rescuer safety standards. Uh, consider the exposure, exposure, but then also limit contamination. And then we talk about the types of contaminants and what kind of biological effects they have and then how to get rid of them. So uh, we also want to talk about area contain, uh, contamination status. Is it fixed? Is it airborne? Is it liquid? Is it running down the drains? Because we, we thought we would decon them like everybody else, like every other thing, and we sprayed a bunch of water, and now this stuff is running everywhere. Um, so patient management priorities include triage. So medical triage is the highest priority. The radiation exposure and contamination is really a secondary concern. The degree of the decontamination is dictated by the number and capacity to treat the other injured victims. So if we're overwhelmed with, with blast injury patients, we're going to be spending less effort on decontamination than if we have those two nuclear power plant workers who are injured, but we can swarm them with medical uh, personnel who have experience uh, responding to a radiologic emergency, then we're going to spend more time getting an expert decontamination for them. So we want to limit the time devoted to on-scene treatments because we talked about that. We want to have plan and stay focused because we, people get very distracted by, oh my God, it's radioactive out here. Perform only the skills needed to sustain life while on the scene because we actually do want to do a rough decontamination, get out of there, and then consider all the same stuff, ABC, C-spine, mass external bleeding, fracture, mobilization. Um, when you're developing your action plan for each site, or for your community, you need to think of the scope of the response, what teams and organizations, and then it's an all, all uh, multidisciplinary approach. You're still gonna need hazmat, medics, firefighters, police, EMS, and physicians. So if you're the EMS physician is the only person that knows how to do this, or the, um, the uh, special hazards team out of the nuclear plant are the only people that know how to handle this and they haven't spoken or planned along with a ha county hazmat team and the fire chief, you got yourself a problem. Um, and then PPE considerations, you know, you. We can talk about the public uh, safety personnel, uh, but you know, police, fire, EMS, and the hospital staff are all gonna be worried about this. The good news is the Ebola stuff has actually, or I should say, preparation for emerging infectious diseases has actually um, put us in better position to manage uh, these types of events than we were prior. And you'll see why I say that in a minute. So we need survey meters we need for, to respond. We need survey meters, dosimeters for pe personnel, medical gear, litter devices, extraction equipment, and sheets. And sheets, actually, more than we would normally want. We want to increase in egress routes with control measures, and then on-scene actions are going to include all the same stuff, evacuation search, medical care, and victim identification. And again, we're going to treat life threats, and they're probably not going to be from radiation contamination. Um, at least one outer clothing should be removed before transport of these patients to the hospital. These are usually dry materials that we're worried about. Some of it is wet, but it's usually not, you know, usually not covered in, in liquid uh, that would require you to spray them off. As much as possible, we want to leave the contaminated materials behind. And in this case, because it's highly regulated, regulated if you know it's radiologic material, it really should be bagged uh, and uh, properly uh, labeled because you want to look for like ground zero, uh, evidence for later and you want them to be able to take this stuff and immediately take it off to be identified some identification could be done in the field of what the emitter is but some of this requires uh, uh, quick transport of those of that evidence off to a radiologic uh, identification lab and there are several uh, in the country that that can do uh, that type of work in a quick quick effort and then we want to send all the victims identification in a plastic bag of the ED as long as it's not heavily contaminated so that people know who they're dealing with. We need sheets and pillowcases to keep, them, keep everybody from kneeling on the contaminated ground. We're going to place equipment in plastic bags. We're going to only take the essential equipment because everything else is going to have to be decontaminated and surveyed. We're going to cover our exposed surfaces in our ambulances with plastic and sheets. And we're going to delineate the contaminated area with signage, tape, and markings. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? We're going to restrict access to essential personnel and resources, designated entry and exit points, provide radiation monitoring at all entry and exit portals if possible, establish decontamination sites as dictated by the patient medical status, and then we're going to limit removal of items from the contaminated area because we don't want this all spread everywhere throughout the community. And then when they get to the hospital, they're going to have some of the they're going to have basically the exact same concerns. So, how are we going to detect and measure radiation? Well, first of all, you know some some 
fire departments already have uh, survey meters. And if they have a hazmat team, typically they have some way to measure in, uh, environmental radiation. They may or may not have a sur actual survey meter. If it's a survey meter, it has that pancake wand on it. If it just looks like the box without the cord, that basically just gives you sort of a background area radiation. It's a little bit different deal. So you want to locate the contamination, measure the exposure rate, and the exposure rate is how we're going to determine our operational guidelines based on what the regulatory limitations are. So we really need to be able to get that and accurately report that, uh, that measured exposure rate. Personal dosimeters are a good idea if you have them. Um, they come as uh, they come as film, which really doesn't help us because it's just going to tell us later. Uh, but there's also two right now, right here, right now types of dosimeter. There's the little digital dosimeter, and then there's the little metal tube with a wire in it that you turn to zero, and then you can wear on your person, and you can actually hold it up to the light and look and see where you are, so you can tell how much radiation you've actually received. So some type of uh, personal dosimeter on each uh, responder when there's a known uh, potential exposure is a good idea. We're going to limit exposure as much as possible, either with shielding, distance, and then obviously we're going to do time. We're going to keep time knowing the exposure rate, uh, uh, the rate of exposure, and then we can determine the amount of time. So we're going to do it, use Alera just like we would normally would. So we're going to work quickly and efficiently. We're going to keep as much distance. So if so, for example, if someone's there to help, but they're not working directly on the patient, they should step back at least a few feet. Um, and then, you know, we can use different things if we're going to pull, uh, if we're going to set up a, a, a physician response, you may want to be using, you may need to tape, tear open your field surgery kit. And if you do, you want to use those uh, big uh, uh, Kelly forceps instead of putting your fingers right on things, just to give yourself a little extra protection, keep yourself back from it. Put contaminated metal or glass and lead uh, containers if you've got them, but we probably won't have those at the time. So this is just a quick example of how Alera is really, this is legitimate, and distance has a huge impact that we sometimes forget about. Look at the distance chart here. So if you're at one foot, this is based on 5 rem. Uh, if you're at a distance of one foot, it'll be 12.5 rem per hour, so you can stay for 24 minutes. If that person steps back one more foot, then they're getting 3.1 rem an hour, and they can stay 1.6 hours at that distance. If they step back three more feet, they can be there for 10 hours. If they step back to eight feet, they can be there for 25 hours and still be with an acceptable exposure. So distance makes a huge difference, and short distances can make a big difference depending on what the emitter is. Here's a, this is from the, um, the folks down at REACT, and this is their uh, model for for uh, the decontamination multi-casual accident area. So you've got your non, on the left you see you've got your non-contaminated uninjured patients and your non-contaminated injured patients. Well, they're non-contaminated, so guess what? They just go right to the control point, bang, they're out of there based on their triage and transport scheme that you would normally use. Then we have our contaminated uninjured patients and our contaminated injured patients. So if they're contaminated and seemingly uninjured, uh, they'll go to the control point and from there, that point, they can have an aggressive, slow, methodical decontamination. For the contaminated injured people, they need more of a field decontamination and out they go through the control point. And when, when we meter them to leave the control point, we're gonna accept some contamination potentially based on their level of physical injury. Whereas the uninjured people will not leave that control point with any contamination if you have the resources to do the decontamination. We'll talk about resource management in a minute too. So if you have a multi-casualty radiation incident triage site, you can have a holding area for deceased. Remember, they may be contaminated, but we're not going to spend time, we're going to spend time metering all and surveying all of them. We're just going to hold them in an area and assume they're all contaminated. For the reds, obviously, close off, wrap the patient, bang, they're out of there. We basically cocoon them in a sheet and they go. Uh, and we come in assuming some contamination. For people that have followed our sort of yellow category, close off, retriage, and if they're stable enough for decon measures, they get decon measures. And they would see how it says survey there, that's because we're using the pancakes uh, 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 probe to, to survey them, wand them down properly. For greens, close off and decon because they are stable. And then they're gonna stay in a holding area. Um, and they're probably gonna be there for a while. So this is the same thing we would do with our, with our you know, bus accidents or big MCIs, we're gonna hold them in some sort of warm sheltered environment 
uh, so that we delay their arrival to the hospital as they manage the critical patients. And then you're going to have your same ambulance staging area, loading area, and off you go. Just keep in mind that when you're putting a contaminated patient in a uh, ambulance and you send that ambulance to the hospital, the triage officer may, should make it very clear to that crew that they are expected to turn that ambulance back around and bring it back without decontaminating it because now it's contaminated and it's presumably contaminated with the exact same radiologic source that the next patient that you want to transport is contaminated with. So you should keep those in heavy circulation. So your handoff at the hospital has to also be efficient enough in your system to bring that contaminated crew and ambulance back to get another contaminated patient. Um, this is right out of the uh, HHS uh, presentation. I just wanted to show you this very quickly. This is their nuclear detonation damage zone um, uh, model. And you can see the same kind of thing, yellow, excuse me, red, orange, yellow, and then purple. And this is just a follow-up pattern. This just kind of shows that sort of uneven pattern. And right here they show you this is 0.1 kilogram, or excuse me, 0.1 kiloton detonation, 1 kiloton detonation, and 10 kiloton. So these are obviously nuclear uh, detonations, which means they meet critical mass. This is a highbrow uh, radiologic emergency because these people actually got themselves a nuclear bomb. So... Uh, going on with another one of their slides, which I think is worthy of showing you. They do, they demonstrate this point that we're making about combined, uh, about trauma, uncontaminated, unexposed, just exposed people, people, and then people who have been both traumatized and exposed. Uh, and it changes kind of how you expect them to turn out. So obviously this table, what it demonstrates is that when you combine trauma and uh, radiation exposure, people do not do well. So here's their triage, here's a triage um, schema based on that. And this is, obviously you're not gonna pull this out and try to use this, but this is just demonstrating the point that as the radiation dose goes up, and there's no trauma here, by the way, this is just radiation dose, but as the radiation dose goes up, we can expect uh, certain outcomes. So if they've gotten more than 10 gray, then we really got to think about whether or not we're going to try to save them. So if you go along the bottom here, this axis is how much, uh, re how many resources you have available. So I don't know that it says normal conventional and then it says good. I honestly have to believe that most medical systems are running at fair most of the time, which is really sad, but you're probably somewhere between good and fair in your own community because of our hospital, for example, is maxed out. I can't admit more people. I probably can't take a big surge in the ED and have good outcomes. So we're probably somewhere between good and fair. So if you're at a mass casualty and you've got more than a couple patients, you need to start thinking about this. So it changes the way we think about our triage scheme based on what resources we have. And you're going to probably be the one in that command center or on that scene that's going to be able to make those type of alterations to our usual triage scheme. Now, it gets a lot more complicated, unfortunately, if we have what we expect to have, which is a combined trauma and radiation exposure issue. So this is a little more complicated, but I'm trying to illustrate to the point to you that you really need to be thinking also, maybe even putting this into your disaster plan that says, hey, if, system, if we're system status, five, we do this, four, we do this, three, we do this, one, we do this, zero, we do this. We're going to actually alter the way we triage these patients because of based on our resources. And then here it shows kind of planning, city planning uh, or community planning uh, based on uh, modeling. And again, you can go to that website and sort of see how the modeling would work, but they can actually model this out for you. When this is gonna happen, you're gonna call for help immediately because you're gonna need this kind of high level modeling and considerations about what's gonna happen. So a lot of federal individuals are gonna get involved very quickly and they're gonna try to help uh, in your planning, but you need to kind of, if you had the resources in your community to pre-plan this and you, and they can do statistical modeling based on the prevailing winds, uh, uh, in your own community and you can have options with the prevailing winds, North, Northwest at, at X miles per hour, then this hospital over here, this is going to be the one we take everybody to. So it seems kind of, you know, wow, that's complicated, but yes, it really is. But people have actually gone to this level, uh, of, uh, detail in their planning and it is possible 
uh, with a little bit of help for some, from some friends. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through, flip through these slides like you have never seen slides slip through before because guess what? This looks a lot like what we're doing already. So now, this is a little less involved. You know, there's no paper on this individual and they're not hooded up. But this is basically what it takes to prevent yourself being, from being uh, contaminated with pretty much everything that's going to contaminate you at one of these scenes. This gentleman has a uh, survey meter there and he's trying to determine whether or not it's safe to enter. But he's donned up just like uh, we would for uh, Ebola, except not as bad. So if you have already spent a lot of time and effort, money and, tra and, and training in getting people ready to respond to infection, emerging infectious diseases, then you could, in fact, to simplify, uh, able to use the same protection, except that you can downgrade to either a surgical mask or you can even let them use an N95 mask if you wanted. But they, that's the only thing that's the, the airway protection is slightly less uh, than you would really consider for like an Ebola situation. But since they're already training to do it, you know, they could use that same tactic. So here's how, this is kind of how that we expect, you know, here's an individual, they're wearing a suit, but that was just to make the pictures easier to take. But you can see they kind of roll, they take these pre-rolled sheets. Remember I said you're going to want to have sheets? You take this pre-rolled sheet and you get it up to the person, close to the person, you log roll them, you log roll them back on the sheet, now they're on the sheet, okay? Then you cut off their clothes. So you cut off the outer layer of clothes. Again, in this case, it was a suit. But uh, you cut away and you cut away from the airway, never up towards the head. And then we do this peculiar little rolling technique where you roll the clothes down on themselves underneath. And then we can actually roll again the patient out of that and roll up that contamination into that singular sheet. And we roll our backboard, we roll our patient into a little burrito, or cocoon as it says on the slide. And now we've got a packaged patient with limited potential for contamination of everybody else. When, this is, this is a, obviously a pre-hospital discussion, but just very briefly, if you were to set up, uh, if you're going to an alternate site, like here in New Central New York, we would go to the fairgrounds. We actually have the fairgrounds, plus we have our own um, backup emergency department there uh, that can be fully uh, operational. We even has an OR. Um, so we might actually have to set up our own, basically, mini hospital uh, for response to this. But you should also make sure in your community that your hospitals already have this concept in mind. And there's usually a radiation control officer at your hospital if they do nuclear medicine. So you can easily work with them and I'm sure they've already have this uh, concept in mind if not you can talk about it but um, this is pretty standard we set up our, our contaminant area where we're going to treat the patient this is trauma room it wouldn't have to be you have your buffer zone with waste the step off pad this is basically your control zone and your radiation survey equipment so you make sure none of this goes out there then you have your clean area where there's clean gloves masks, gowns and booties so uh, you basically have a control zone with a controller here Who's, who is donned, but, but uh, can be a little bit less donned than everybody else. And they're gonna be controlling the survey and allowing only clean people to leave the treatment area. And again, having this, by the way, I'm not gonna go through this, but having the sign, literally having a cart and a sign that says how to put the clothes on, what order to put them on and, how, and what order to take them off, uh, works really well. And in fact, in our own facility, actually at both uh, hospitals that are designated in our community to receive uh, uh, radiological contaminated patients, their carts have big signs on them and you just literally put them out front of the room so that people don't get it, don't have to remember how to do this. Showering victims, just a note on decontamination real quick, showering of victims is not normally indicated. You want to control the runoff and decon, decon solution and then you really want to protect the patients from the elements. So right now, today in Syracuse, New York, it would be a bad idea to set up a shower tent. Um, management, if we kill more people with hypothermia uh, and, uh, than we would with whatever uh, continued exposure they get from the contamination potentially. Management of a radiologic event. So again, continued medical support. We're going to do environmental cleanup considerations here. We call the DEC um, and the hazmat team should know to do that themselves. Bioassay screening and if indicated, we can get whole body counters set up and, and, uh, 
and try to figure out how much contamination there really is. Decorporation therapy, we spent a lot of time, if you remember in medical school, you talked about chelators and such. I'm going to show you the chart. I'm going to show you the chart, but um, there are a limited group of patients who have an actual ingestion or, or internal contamination that need potentially could benefit from decorporation therapy. Then there's really a big component, and this is the terrorism side of this is what they're looking for. This is their instrument of, uh, of uh, choice is that psychological damage. So we need to have psychological counseling and support uh, and follow-up assistance uh, for victims. So decorporation th treatment, very quickly, it's all about displacement, dilution, and chelation. So here's a, this chart. Basically, you can look this up. It's in several manuals. I'm, I'm abbreviated some things when I made this. But basically, you know, there's a whole list. If you know what you're dealing with, you've identified the, 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 the uh, radiologic contaminant and uh, the ingested contaminant, then there is a specific prescribed antidote that you might consider to give to the patient. So you can see things like iridium, it says plus minus oral penicillin. Mm, it might work. It might not. We're not really sure. These are little things that are hard to do a double blinded placebo controlled trial on, as you might imagine. But there are there is a list of, of uh, radio elements and their and their um, antidote. Here's one that's common and you saw this in the literature and pitch people are buying it for themselves and their family and their, their employees in the California for a while. That's just good old-fashioned uh, potassium iodide cat tablets. This is a classic example of uh, displacement. So what they're – I've got a dose table here just for fun. This is from REACTS. But it shows, you know, adults over 40, you know, how much predicted absorbed dose of the thyroid, the thyroid will pick up uh, if there was a cloud of this toxic uh, – excuse me, a radioactive uh, iodide. And this is the dose, 130 milligrams. You take one tablet out of the pack and you're covered, Okay. And it gives all the way down to little babies about how much they should have. All right. So key resources, because when the time comes, you're not going to think back and say, we had that one EMS Medicine Live lecture on this. I'm ready to go. Uh, this is really just a primer. But I want you to have uh, heard these names, and these are easily uh, – you can easily look these things up and contact them and get materials. REACTS actually teaches courses. Uh, the intro course is called Radiation Emergency Medicine, radio, uh, Radiation Emergency Medicine, and then they even have an advanced radiation medicine course, and they're very good. But the REACTS Center is a Radiation Emergency Assistance Center training site. It's at Oak Ridge. Uh, it's really cool. They give you a tour, and you can go out and drive around so you can see where they make, you know, make and store uranium. and plutonium. It's really cool. Um, but there's their phone number. You could even put that in your phone. God forbid you'd ever have to call them because these guys can coordinate every, all the federal response for you, and they can give you online medical provider advice based on information that you feed them. The other obvious thing is if you have a new, nearby nuclear facility, they pretty much all are interested in any environmental exposure as well. So even though it's not at their facility, if you call if I called Nine Mile right now and said, we've got an exposure here, someone blew off a dirty bomb, they would send their response to you. They'd response team. Now I'm going to have expert service hazmat guys and the guys from the hospital. So it's a sort of a big deal. And then your hospital radiation safety officer is a great uh, resource because they're right there at your hospital. They know this stuff. They understand the physics. They've been certified for the most part. And so – uh, they, you really want to go to them and talk about what their plans are. And if there was an incident, even if it was a field incident, you expect a lot of patients to go to the hospital you want to uh, involve them. This is just an elaboration of what I said about there's being a lot of federal agencies. This doesn't even include the, uh, the HSS guys. They've got their own planning and development uh, situation. But if you see REACTS is right here. If you call REACTS, guess what they do? They bounce all that information right here, and all of these people – get notified. So everybody who's important to help you mitigate your disaster will be on their way. I want another thing I wanted to mention to you is this thing called REM and you can get that get to that easily by remm.nlm.gov and it gives you like this it's basically a stepwise quick uh, just in time user friendly interface and you can click these boxes and you can follow along and it gives you some you know idea of what am I what should I be doing? So, how do EMS physicians fit in this? Well, I think I gave you some idea how EMS physicians fit in it. You may be the only, you may be the, if you're the disaster and emergency preparedness expert, guess what? You are now also the radiological emergency expert. You have to be. So, uh, if you're not, then you 
probably as an EMS physician, work closely with those people. So in our region, in the Central New York region, we have our EMS physician response team with five members plus the fellow. We get there by air, ground, depending, usually by ground. So if, if we had this this event, we are automatically in the matrix. We're dispatched to this because this would be considered an MCI. And we're going to be able to communicate health physics information to healthcare providers and leadership personnel in the field and the hospital. So when people are panicking and decide, trying to decide whether or not they're going to actually render assistance and aid at this MCI, it's important for us to understand the doses, understand the dose response, be able to look at the survey meter and say, guys, we're safe. Just don up and let's get this done. Let's take care of these people. Or <laughs> in a worst case scenario, we'll be able to look at that meter and say, you know what? This isn't safe. Those people are already dead. The exposure is too high. We're not going in there. Okay. But in most cases, you're going to be telling, you're going to be a reassuring factor. You are going to be the expert. And then you need to reinforce patient care priorities. If you're going to be thinking about radiation, you need to be thinking about bomb blasts, okay, trauma. And then you're going to have to communicate. You're probably going to be the one that's going to be communicating at the command center with REACTS because other people are going to be thinking of other things. You want to maintain that communication with the IC and the hospitals. So anytime you have a major incident, uh, if you have a field response physician program, uh, you may have – you're probably built into that communication in some way, either advisory or directly. And then you want to communicate with a hazmat and, and with the nuclear authority to confirm isotope identification because we want to know what that is so that we can really understand the risk. And then really remember, just like in any other MCI, you want a patient track. Some summary points. Responders can safely care for contaminated victims, and you're the one that's going to have to remind them of that. Ionizing radiation is detectable and measurable, so you know the risk. Decontamination is typically a secondary concern, but is pretty, um, pretty basic at the scene. Poor con uh, contamination of radioactive material can represent a significant nuisance. So if you spread it all around the place or you spread it all around the hospital, then it's going to cause a lot of effort to clean it up, even though it may not be biologically terribly dangerous. And then physiological effects, psychological effects really uh, shouldn't be underestimated. But wait, here's the but wait sign, uh, slide. So that's, that's the background. Now let's quickly go through uh, uh, some scenario-based thinking about this. So mass exposure, when is it going to happen? Well, the big one, right, is the critical criticality events. Somebody gets an improvised nuclear device or they have a reactor release, and you're going to have criticality. You give nucleotide de uh, contamination is much more likely. We could go today in Syracuse, and I could find radiologic sum substances. And if I could steal them, I could put them enough together, and I could create a dirty bomb if I was a terrorist. So this is in every community in America. This can be done. And it's, it's going to be an intentional contamination. Some people have taken these sources, literally put them in the drop ceiling of their boss it in like this one guy killed his boss by putting a, a uh, radioactive isotope in the guy's drop ceiling. Another horrible, nasty, disgusting person. He was estranged from his wife. So he took the source and he stuck it in the crib of his own child. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with these people, but these people are out there and they can get their hands on this stuff. And then, you know, the other, the other issue is an external, external radiation source, like industrial medical source that, that goes awry, gets mishandled. Uh, it ends up in, you know, a transportation accident. All right, terrorist event with a low yield nuclear weapon. The ener energy distribution, about 50% is going to be blast, 35% is going to be thermal, and 15% is going to be the ionizing radiation. Okay, so the blast and the thermal radiation is the gross majority of what's going to happen. Health injuries are going to be injuries, burns, penetrating ion injury, in ionizing injury could be prompt or delayed. And then there's a consideration for fallout depending on what the isotope is. And if it's a low yield nuclear weapon, it's going to be significant. So there's going to be some penetrating ionized radiation, and then you're going to have to try to estimate dose based on distance uh, to the scene. And then the fallout, you're going to have to have that modeling to know who was exposed. And they may have, remember, they could be two days prodrome and not really know they already have radiation sickness. Blast and thermal effect, uh, this is a little... Uh, some diagrams, old-fashioned slides, but they still hold true. You see that 35% uh, thermal, and here's your residual radiation, here's your blast. And then this is from a uh, nuclear weapon. You can see here the radius of the fireball, then the blast LD50, so that these are people dying from the actual explosion. Then there's the thermal LD50, and then the radiation LD50. So the radiation will get you from far away, farther away from uh, ground zero than the other stuff, but this is the primary killer. Um, 
So just a couple other quick things. You know, if people are at ground zero of the explosion, you can have a permanent or temporary blindness. Uh, so you need to keep that in mind. You're trying to direct people at a mass casualty. Some of these people are going to have flash blindness. They could be fairly far away and still be completely blind at the moment. So you have to keep that in mind. You could have a number of people who can't hear and can't see. Um, and the can't see people could be farther away from the blast. This is just a quick thing. This is uh, New York City, obviously. And uh, this is, uh, they, they had a point of detonation downtown. And this shows lethal dose. Uh, and then it shows uh, your exposures. Okay, so this is all based on radiation. Um, the Russians are missing a number of suitcase nuclear devices. Yes, they made suitcase nuclear devices. And it's similar to our old Davy Crockett nuclear artillery warhead. So yes, we had art uh, nuclear artillery because we were that smart. Um, actually, scared, it was part of the nuclear detente, but, um, but they existed and we had them. They're war little artillery mounted warheads. Um, the result, this is basically modeled off the result if they, a Davy Crockett went off in New York City. That being said, that's about the same as the Russian nuclear, or as Russian suitcase nuclear devices that are missing. So the people within 1,200 feet receive a lethal dose of radiation uh, from the blast. So if that's in Times Square or Wall Street or anywhere in a heavily populated city, anywhere in America, uh, you could imagine that would be significant. Based on this modeling, it would be, uh, you know, about 50,000 fatalities, an estimation about 200,000 casualties. So even for this small warhead, if it was a real nuclear device, you get yourself problems. A couple of things, remember, dirty bombs more likely. Uh, it's not a nuclear blast, uh, so it's a different scenario. And then you're going to have all kinds of misinformation about radiation and all kinds of stuff. It's like when we had a – what was it? Uh, it? We were in Texas, and we had uh, some sort of factory collapse or explosion or something. And the news media got out there and said, uh, everybody should immediately report to the hospital to donate blood. And they, all these well people, well-wishing people showed up and flooded the hospital. We didn't, weren't even taking blood. We didn't even need blood. So, you know, imagine what it would be like if there was actual radiologic uh, dirty bomb blown off in a heavily populated area. So the Russian nuclear suitcase devices, 84 of the 120, uh, 132 devices are missing. The Russian general Lebed in 1998 said, we do not know what the status of the other devices is. We just could not locate them. I feel safe. Uh, and then the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense in 2003, whose job was to track this, said, no direct evidence that any have been stolen. Okay. However, on the black market side of things, the number of materials seized by April 2001, 217 low-grade nuclear weapons, or no low-grade, excuse me, nuclear material, 14 weapon-grade material, and 299 radioactive sources. So remember we talked about the thing the guy put in the, could make, you could make a dirty bomb out of, you could, or you could kill somebody by putting it in their office. 299 of those. So those are just the ones they found and seized. Dirty bomb suitcase device. This is just a mock-up of what one might look like. Um, so, you know, it just looks like a bunch of junk in a suitcase. If you opened it, hopefully you'd see the little radioactive material symbols. But guess what they would probably do? They'd probably disguise it somehow inside the suitcase. Here's another one. Here's this pipe bombs on top of a radioactive material. So that it's going to explode and it's just going to spray this stuff everywhere. So there'll be burns and, and stuff, but you're going to have a bunch of radionucleotide everywhere. This is going to make a big mess. After the 1991 Gulf War, Iraqis disclosed that they had worked on RDD made of iron bombs packed with zirconium oxide irradiated in a research reactor. So even they were working on dirty bombs as a part of a state-funded and state-driven, uh, basically, dirty bomb program. Over 200 of the 2 million regulated reactive sources uh, and devices are lost, stolen, or abandoned each year in the United States. And cesium-137, remember the, the guy walked in there 45 seconds later, he was a dead man. The most commonly lost radiation source has a 33-year half-life emits beta at a high uh, energy level and gamma at a higher energy level and substitutes for potassium in the body. So guess what? You integrate it. Um, so, and then, you know, this is just another point. This is some, some quotes, but this is all true. That basically... The, the key to terrorism is to expose many and, and, and kill few because it's terrorism. 
So the dirty bomb threat really is a big deal and we really need to be thinking about it. And that's why becoming sort of masters of uh, mitigating this uh, contamination issue and making sure we don't lose sight of, of preventable death from trauma is really something I really want you guys to kind of think about and, and focus on when you consider your own uh, disaster prep. So immediate radiation injury, you know, very few cancers, small increase to overall 25%. And the exceptions are iodine and children's thyroid cancer. That obviously is a consideration. And then birth defects, only a, only a, a certain uh, for a few, so if any, and has been dramatically overestimated in the past. So, so truth be told, that's probably not as big a deal as we thought it was. So some final summary points. Responders can safely care for contaminated victims, and you're going to have to make sure that's true on the, on the scene based on information. Um, ionizing radiation is detectable and measurable, like we said. Decontamination is typically a secondary concern. Or containment of radioactive material can cause significant financial, political, and psychological issues later. So everything we can do to mitigate it within reason is appropriate. And then never forget about the psychological effect. And at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Or have comments, because I'd love to hear what you guys, uh, what kind of plans you guys have in place or have any experience with this. Maybe I missed this when you were talking, uh, but how long until the feds get on scene for a nuclear event? Well, as far as getting them on scene, that may take a number of hours. Um, but if you're near a nuclear plant, it might be faster. Okay. For example... Fulton, New York's real small town. They can fly jets right into there. Why? Because there's a joint information center there, and they would use they use that as their EOC. There's, you know, you can go in there. It's kind of creepy. Actually, it's a big, huge room, dusty old phones that get dusted off. You know, uh, at their regular uh, drills. But there's FEMA and and uh, and, uh, and uh, NRC and all the all the players that you want there. Homeland Security, of course, has their desk, but it's all there. And these guys can are ready. So in your community, especially in major metropolitan areas, they'll they'll lock into those. They've already probably designated what EOC they're going to use in the case of a related radiological emergency. But the key is to immediately call them. Yeah. We're down to six. Any other comments or questions? Does anybody's plan actually have specifics in their disaster plan? based on a radiologic emergency. There's a lot of silence. I know Pittsburgh does. I mean, they have a, their emergency management folks do have plans. It's been a while since I've seen them, but uh, they do have some response plans in place. Do we, do we even have response plans here with uh, emergency management? Oh yeah, ours does. But it's uh, basically mimics the um, Oswego County plan okay. because that's where the nuclear plants are. So that's where they spent the time and money developing. Awesome. Okay. And New York State has one too. Um, and as they as they brought, came in, they would bring theirs to here. Okay. I think that was great, Derek. You did a that was a great presentation. You did it in less than an hour and fifteen, which I'm impressed by. That's fantastic. Um, so just to wrap it up. Uh, next time, looking at the end of March, uh, Derek, uh, Brian, and I'll get together and figure out a time. Um, Top is coming up. Uh, Rescue Task Force is something I'm passionate about, and we do some training up in here. Uh, I know one of our past fellows is also doing the same thing, so one of us may talk about that. Uh, Chris Martingale had a good presentation about flight physiology, uh, which we may tap him to, uh, to do in the near future when he's free. Um, I don't know if he's still listening, but we'll, we'll volunteer him sometime soon. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Kevin from New York City can do community paramedicine. If you have any topics you want or are interested in, just let us know and uh, we'll get you involved. And if that's it, we're going to end the uh, webinar. Awesome. Okay, Thank thanks guys. Appreciate it. Now I stop recording. There we go.